The more time I was, I was approaching drug dealers who had businesses who were covering money, I ain't gonna get paid out of it or that business will no longer be on the road. It's as simple as that and, and I was renowned for that. One in particular stood up in court and he said, Your Honor, I've stopped selling drugs because of the torment that Ian Flannery has brought to my life. Um, his car was petrol bombed and his, his, um, his, his front door was, somebody opened up a scorpion submachine gun on his front door. Hi guys and welcome back to Care Run TV. We're bringing you the most exciting interviews from around the world. Today we're at a secret location up north. I'm delighted to be in a position to interview Flannery, AKA Irish, AKA The Extortionist. So Flannery, thank you very much for taking the time and letting me come up here today. It's an honor to be coming up here and seeing you, mate. Long time in the making, yeah. You, you wanted to speak to me for quite some time now, but. Well, yeah, obviously everyone wants to know the answers, who you are, everyone's seen you with the Dougie thing, that video that sort of went viral. See, I'm on the road, there's a lot of talk about this fight at the minute, yeah. Just more, there's stacks there, every colour, okay? So, there's a hundred grand in this morning, look. There's a hundred racks in this morning, you've seen the figures, yeah? Just know if anyone wants to come with another hundred thousand pounds, or another two hundred thousand pounds, the figures will be covered, okay? And um, so I'm here to obviously try and get the answers for the people and find out about the now sort of infamous Flannery, aka Irish, aka the extortionist, and mm. known for his grills as well. Well, they're not grills; they're my teeth. But they're actually your teeth, are they? Yeah, my 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 original teeth got pulled out, and these got screwed in my head. Jesus. So, Jesus. Ev everyone asks the question, why? It was only because I've had so much finances at the time, and I couldn't. I had too many Rolexes and too many silly things about me, so we stuck as much in my head as we possibly could, so the Crown Prosecution couldn't take any more off of me, so. Nice, nice. So you've got a, uh, a bit of an accent, it seems like a sort of accent between, like a sort of mixed accent. So whereabouts are you from, Flannery? I was, uh, I was born in Limerick Hospital in the south of Ireland on the 30th of May, 1992. And um, that was it. That's, that's where the, the story began as such. And so how long were you, because obviously I know you've moved out to London at some point, what age did you move out to London then from Ireland? I moved, I, ke I came to England when I was 18, 2000, Okay. 2000, 2010 maybe so, 2010, yeah, I'm 29 this year, so. Okay, so just talk about your sort of childhood up into the 18 year, year old point, so how was childhood, <coughs> brothers and sisters, big family, talk to me, was it happy childhood? No, 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 I was born, I was born to um, a single mother, my father wasn't around, he was... Busy due to unforeseen circumstances, I would say. And my mother done her best. She she broke her back to give me everything she could. It wasn't a lot, but had a lot of love, and I was well catered for. And we 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 didn't have the worst of life, but we we most certainly struggled. Mm. But um, humble beginnings, most certainly. What about school and that? Did you finish your schooling? No, oh. Jesus, I didn't. Um, the only education I had was watches, women and waistcoats. I didn't really have a lot, you know what I mean? But um, mm. that was probably down to my own fault. I had a bad attitude, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was I was whatever I was, you know. I was going on, going through a lot at home. My mum was very unwell at a point and I kind, of, I kind of struggled. I didn't really have much guidance. So school ended for me at about 14. Mm. A young age. And then you're sort of on the streets messing around at their majors, was it? From there? I, was, I used to spend a lot of time in the local pub. I used to spend a lot of time in Madden's pub. And um, Owen was, unfortunately, he was a drug addict and he was an alcoholic. And I would wake him up in the morning. I had a key to get in. I would wake him in the morning. I would go to Mull Queens. I would get him his breakfast, which consisted of cornflakes and a bottle of brandy and the racing post. And I was just being educated in life a different way. You know, then Owen committed suicide when I was 16 years old. It affected me immensely, and I was just um, looking for a, for a gap that could never be filled as such. Mm. And so, let's. Um, what about sort of first brushes with the law? Then, when were you sort of first wrestled, first getting in trouble? With the, law? Um, the first brushes with the law. My my mum used to look after children for a living. She used to mind children for a living, and she used to work for. She used to mind kids for the guy that owned the local supermarket. This was before. Tesco's or Aldi or the big supermarkets were available. And um, my mum used to get paid on a Friday for minding the children all week, working very hard, as I said, as an ill woman to provide for us. And um, she would then take her, her wages and go to the local supermarket and give it all back in a matter of minutes. So the first encounter I had the law was I was arrested for robbing that supermarket. 
in my school uniform. So mm. that was the first brushings I had with the law. Then it escalated a little bit more. As I said, I was out of control. I didn't have any guidance. Um, a lot had gone on in the background. And at the age of 18, my father then stepped in and he said, it's, it's time to have a fresh start. So I jumped on the boat with two black bags and a good looking face and I was off. Nice. And so what about your mother? Go back to her. You don't have to talk about it. So you said she's a little bit ill. How is she at this current she's state? She's very good now. She's full she's of life better. now. She went through chemotherapy. She's in our own remission. So that's the most important thing. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, talk about coming to London then. Um, how that was, 18 years old. And whereabouts in London <coughs> did you go to initially then? I came to the Midlands initially. Okay. I came to the Midlands. Um, I got involved with a couple of people early on. Manny here, who I always mention guided me in the right direction, gave me a bit of guidance. Um, after Manny came Dutch, Dutch Raja in Birmingham. And um, I was very loyal. I was very, I had, a, I had a backbone from the start, mm. you know. Manny here always tell the story of when I met him, the first thing I said to him, but um, I won't get into that boy. He tells it every time he has a drink, that's for sure. Um, and then good, goodness travels, that's did one you, thing. Did you enjoy the Midlands though, after coming over at 18? Yeah, I did, but I then got a prison sentence. Um, obviously coming out from that, um, you're obviously in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. So then, then, then I went to London. I went to London. I found money. Why did you move to London? For the chase of the money? No, no, no. The reason I moved to London was I was an extremely um, distinctive character. I didn't blend anywhere. No. There, there, was a, there was no other Irish man caked in tattoos with a mouthful of gold teeth. I think you stick out anywhere though. There, there was only one, you know. So London had a bit of cover for me as such. And where in London did you go to? Um, initially I went to um, Essex Road in Islington. And did you have people down there? No, I didn't. Me, myself and Irish. So what made you decide to go down there? As I said, I was blessed. I had yeah. earned a few quid out of one little thing that I was after doing. Yeah. I had a few pounds to spend, so instead of buying Valentinos, I decided to just get myself set up in life. Mm. Um, from there, then I got involved in a couple of other bits and pieces, and a couple of years later, I found myself with a a major brush with the law that I couldn't get myself out of, so. Okay, can we talk about that? What happened in that instant? Oh, that was extortion as well. That was my what money. Was businesses my, or individuals? Uh, businesses and individuals. So more time I was, I was approaching drug dealers who had businesses, who were covering money, and who were, who, who had done the donkey work as such. Mm. I was then approaching them saying, listen, your money's being cleared through here. I ain't gonna get paid over there. That business will no longer be on the road. It's as simple as that, and, and I was renowned for that. And um, there was a story of one, one day, people always ask me, did anyone ever say no? I remember one day um, taking a young boy off the, off the sunbed, bollock naked, because the, the owner had refused to pay me, so I opened the sunbed, he come out and got flung out on the road with his balls hanging out. So that was, that was when the name started flowing around a little bit more. And then subsequently I was, I was convicted of extorting. I was convicted of extorting drug dealers. Jesus. It's uh, strange that they can get protected by the law, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm the only man in the whole of the UK, now and ever, to be convicted of extorting a drug dealer with a firearm without a firearm. And so did they send you to the like, Cat A or anything after that, straight away? Where did you go? No, to? it was Cat A on remand in 2015 for a previous crime. Okay. It was Cat A on remand. I don't know, have you done your homework on that? Yeah, crime? so I've heard you were involved in a postal thing um is it a postal sort of kidnapping sort of case um can we talk about that at all yeah i most certainly wasn't involved i just like to clarify that um okay. it was a post stress she was arrested she was kidnapped off her doorstep in the early hours of the morning mm. in her night dress um whoever done it to her scum dirt i don't know how i was involved in the case but um i was on remand for that crime Jeez. you know um you were talking about the extortion stuff that you end up getting convicted of. So did drug dealers go to the police because obviously... Yeah, I had 14. I had 14 drug dealers from across the Midlands and London. One in particular, one who's still selling drugs today. Um, they classed it as racketeering. They said I had a very lucrative business. They, they made me out to be more certainly something that I wasn't. Um, but one in particular stood up in court and he said, Your Honour, I've stopped selling drugs because of the torment that Ian Flannery has brought to my life. My defence then stood up and said, well, Your Honour, my client is a hero. My client has done you a favour. But unfortunately here in England, you can't take the law into your own hands. And I was sent down the steps that day. Mm. Fucking hell, 14 though. That's quite prolific in terms of... I had 14 it's... statements. I had 14 statements. Um, I wasn't liked. I'm not liked now. 
if you're liked in life, it's because you're doing everything right. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Of course. So in terms of um, this no snitching sort of rule in the underworld, it just doesn't exist then. You're the living proof of that in terms of these so-called drug dealers. They're actually trying to use the law to protect their when there's, when, when there's money involved, everybody talks. Mm. That's the long and short of it, you know? I mean, that, that, that is the, the long and short of it. When, when there's money involved, people like to talk, and especially when people are, are parting with money. Mm. You know, nobody likes to go broke, especially on, on, on the grounds of somebody else. And that's what I was doing. I was, any, anything I drove, anything I had, anything, it was, it, it was most certainly, I mean, I was convicted of it, so I can't deny it. Mm. I was convicted of it. The man that got me sent to jail was a drug dealer. And he had been convicted of selling drugs prior to me. So I met you, obviously, with Dougie a few months ago. So when did you meet Doug? When did Dougie come into your life? Is Jesus, Dougie's been on the scene a long time. I've been on the scene with Dougie a long time. Um, I couldn't put a time on it, but them boys are my brothers. They're the tightest. I mean, I met Johnny. I met Johnny in Coventry one night. And uh, Johnny was on his own and he was knocking, he was dropping fellas like pigeons. And um, it was a full nightclub. There was about a thousand people in it and he was on his own and... I got stuck in for him that night. Mm. Why, I don't know. I still don't know the answers to that day, but he had a look at me and I had a look at him and we'd done the job and we got out of there. Manny Hare was there that night as well. Mm. And it was just, it was an initial, the connection was immense, you know, mm. and, and Dougie, Dougie and I are, I mean, I don't think there's two individuals in the whole of the UK that are closer than myself and Dougie, that's for sure. Yeah, so you really took to each other and become flat family. Yeah, most certainly, Jesus Christ. There's only one invite I get at Christmas anywhere in England, and that's that's the Dougie Joyce's and the mother and father's house, you know. Mm. Most certainly. I can, could ring them boys at any hour of the morning. They can ring me the same way. You know, where you see them, you see me, and that's the way it'll always be. Mm. So um, you were talking earlier also about your teeth, obviously, that now you sort of become infamous, and like you say, it's, uh, <laughs> can't go anywhere about being spotted with these teeth. And so when was it you got the teeth done then? Um, after the first sentence, my teeth got done. The Crown Prosecution were all over me for my assets. They said I was living a lifestyle beyond my means. I had no source of income. I had no national insurance number. I didn't have. I wasn't on paper. Mm. You know, I was just this good-looking Irish man who was floating around, and I was in a different city every day, and I was always looking good and living good. You know what I mean? I was in and out of country all the time as well. I was back and forth to Holland, and um, you know. So what were you doing in Holland? Sorry yeah, to interrupt I was, you. I was waiting for you to say that. Normally, when when a man is living how I'm living and back and forth to Holland, there's a reason why. I just had a friend out there and I was back and forth. Initially, I mean, the police had a different version on it, didn't they? They would have, you know, but mm. I've never been involved in anything like that in my life, that's for sure. So now obviously you've got a mouthful of gold, obviously worth some money. What about in jail and stuff? Has anyone ever tried to come to you or step to you or? It's in jail, it's jail, so you, you know. Obviously like anyone you've had your Fair share of trouble in jail or? Yeah, yeah, it's nothing that a tin of tuna and a sock wouldn't sort out, you know what I mean? I, what, what's anyone going to do? It's the same, to be fair, you, you'd have you'd have more chance of coming to my front door today and doing a bit more damage than in jail. Jail is, you know, you, you're locked up, you can't get, I can't get away from them and they can't get away from me. Everyone's trying to live quiet, you know? Mm. So, you know, um, you said that during the extortion case that one of these drug dealers actually stood up in court. Do you want to name him or name and shame him at all? No, I won't name him for the simple reason is if I name him, I'd have to name them all. He's, he's lived very difficult since. Um, when I was on the way to prison from that caucus after being sentenced, mm. um, his car was petrol bombed and his, his, um, his, his front door was, somebody opened up a Scorpion submachine gun on his front door, which I was on the way to prison and I had been on trial. So, I mean, it was absolutely nothing got to do with me. I, I, I didn't have a phone. I couldn't make a phone call, you know, but... I know he's, he's he's not around. He's I mean I'm free now. I've done my time and I'm and I'm out here. You know what you have to remember is when you stand up in court and you point the finger at someone that never goes away. Of course, you know? especially when you're living a illicit life as well. You don't really have the right to go to the law, do you? No, certainly such? not. No, certainly not. Um, so like I said, when I came to meet you previously with Dougie, he was obviously is to talk about his bare knuckle fight. Are you from the travelling community or no, are you just I'm not. Irish? I'm, so, not. I'm just I'm just Irish. Yeah, so probably people probably make a misconception where they see you so close with Dougie and that I presume you were cousins and stuff with him and obviously of traveller descent, where obviously a lot of people the Irish accent people presume in this country who are involved in. Yeah, it comes with a stigma, that's for sure. Yeah, so you're literally just a Irish man, full out, full on Irish man. Just Irish, yeah. I'm supposed to be in a pair of Wellington boots picking potatoes, you know what I mean? But 
I liked lubes and fast cars, so I didn't really have time for that shit, you know what I mean? Indeed. So you know, you, uh, so you've got no plans to go back to Ireland or anything like this anytime soon? Well, you, you took to England, you like England, England's now your home. I mean, with the surveillance that I'm on at the moment, with this, with, with, with current situations, I'm, I've no real... I've no real comfort here at the moment, mm. you know, my children are here, so, so that's the reason why I'm here, mm. but um, I most certainly have plans to, that is the thing with me, I come on the scene, yeah. anyone will tell you this if you've probably heard already, I come on the scene, you'll see me for three weeks and you won't see me for three months, and I mean, you see where you are today, there ain't nobody going to find Ian Flannery's front door, No, I'm out of the way. And know? so what about, did your mum follow you over from Ireland, so that's your Ireland link back there, did you, get, did you get a chance to go back there and see her a lot? Most certainly not, no. On the phone to her, she's on the phone to me My eldest son is on the phone to her all the time. Um, you've only just been released again from prison um, last week. Last Wednesday, a week, a week to today, yeah. Mm. I've had two two podcasts in that week. I've another one in two days' time. And then, as you know, the, the individual that contacted me, he's looking for me next week, but I'm a little bit reluctant on that one for different reasons. But um, So, yeah, you're a man in demand, that goes without saying. I'm in the media right now, and I think from the base of England right to the top, I think I'm, I'm possibly the most talked about individual at the moment for different reasons. Definitely. Um, they're all wrong and they're all incorrect. The media are painting a picture of me, which I most certainly am not. Mm. Um, and that's kind of the only reason why I've decided to speak, because a lot of people have been in touch with me recently or, or previous to this, and I've always chose to, to keep them out because I never wanted to be in the limelight. Mm. But um, so now is your sort of chance to tell the truth, and so, so you managed to obviously get bail. I got judge in chambers with finances, handing in my passport, GPS tag, which I don't give a fuck about. Because how much money did you put up? I don't wish to disclose that information. It was it was a massive sum. It's a sum that nobody in the courthouse would earn in one year, mm. and. Um, it was a sum that shouldn't have been given to me, considering they know I have no source of income. But as soon as the sum was produced, they were very happy to take it. Yeah. And um, so talk to me about this GPRS thing. this is a new thing. So this isn't a tag that you need to be in at 7, 8 o'clock. Well, you can go wherever. I'm banned from London. I'm banned from Luton. So it's um, literally tracking you 24-7. They, they, they can press a button and, and know where I am, which is fine by me. That's good for me and the reason because a lot of people have a great habit of saying, oh, Irish is on my doorstep. Oh, that Irish guy kept in tattoos with a mouthful of gold. Like, it's, it's, it's been a talking point for years. Yeah, yeah, so it's a good thing for you. No one can lie about you. Listen, I know, I'm, I know categorically I'm not involved in any form of criminal activity in any shape or form. Um, they've raided my property and found £49,000 in cash in my property. Which, yeah, I mean, no, nobody really keeps 49000 in the cooker. What I did, as you know, I've no family and nowhere to put it and whatever else, and it was there for a different reason. Yeah, you don't so. deal with banks, and that's, that was your bank at that time. And that was it. So, so they, were, you, were they, you under investigation? I was under, I was under, they told me that I was under 24 hour surveillance for whatever reasons, but if I was under surveillance, you'd know I haven't got these finances illegally, most certainly. But them finances have been taken and they have not been brought into the case, they have not been mentioned. So I don't know who's got that £49,000 now. But well, I most certainly don't. Mm, well, hopefully you can get your rightfully earned money back. Do you know what I mean? Certainly. So I'll mean, prove what I got the finances, and, and that's it. The case will be thrown out like the other ten have been thrown out. You got to remember, when I get arrested, I get remanded. This twenty-four hour bullshit. They look. They, they, re they arrest me twenty-four hours. They look for an extension for twelve hours. They always get that. Why I don't fucking know. And then it's straight to jail. You know, I'm back cooking, cooking mackerel in my in my kettle. So. So it must have been some... Um... You've got to remember, I've been in jail. You know, you, know, you see the posts on Instagram, you see, you see people like to throw me about there for whatever reason it is. I mean, I don't interact with it much, but I come out, I've come out of jail a, a lot of times. I've never been convicted of any of those crimes. So girls message me and boys message me and say, oh, you're out again, what did you do this time? I didn't do fuck all. I've been remanded for a crime I was found not guilty of once again and released. So I went to jail for extortion. I come out, I was guilty. Yeah, and you hold your hands up to that, but now, that? You, now you don't do anything, so no. I need to leave you alone. You know yeah, I mean? but that's not the case. The case is, when you're living good like me, and you're, you're doing what you're doing in life, they tend to to, to keep keep going, you know? So I've always also heard that there's sort of suspicions, that the police have suspicions that you're involved with the firearms and stuff like this, is that correct? The talk around me, you have to remember the extortion case the individual who gave evidence against me said that I, I shoved a gun in his mouth. He said that 
shoved the gun in his mouth and I told him that whatever I told him but on the CCTV it sees me arriving at his door I did have a man bag on I stepped in over the doorstep about 90 seconds and then I come back out mm. my hand was in the bag when I come off the doorstep and then my hand comes out of the bag there was no firearm found my DNA has never been found on a firearm and they've taken swabs of my body more times than that there's never been any gun residue found on me but, um, they say that I was a kingpin in the firearm trade why I don't know I've never been found with one and the only reason why that is is for the simple reason is they had a man to say he'd seen me with a gun that's all they had they've never ever found me with a drug I've never been found with a drug there's never been a drug put to me there never ever will be because I'm not involved in drugs in any shape or form and I most certainly won't be okay so talking about obviously money and stuff like this how do you earn your living at the moment obviously you're nice for money it's, it's evident <laughs> you've got a mouthful of gold can we talk about how you earn your living today it's it's um it's legitimate. Yeah. As I said at one point, it was not. But I mean, I, I was released a long time ago now. Do you know what I mean? And I've worked very hard for what I have. As you can see it around you today. Yeah. I'm not right. living like the average twenty-eight year old man. Definitely that's for not. sure. And um, it just it's when I'm in a different city and I'm doing all I'm doing and I'm flying in and out of the country and I'm living good. The question is, where's he getting it from? Just like you've asked. Of I don't need to declare that. But when I'm asked to declare it legitimately, I most certainly can, like I did last week, to be stood here in front of you today. Mm. And um, obviously we touched on the firearm stuff. At, you've been on the receiving end of the firearm at a certain point, is that correct? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, obviously I showed you the wounds and whatever else. Um, talk about how that, that incident and when it was and what the circumstances... I don't really talk much about it because a lot went on around it. Um, people that know me and people that are close to me know I've been, I've been on the receiving end of it, but... Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of talk at that point around different things, so I, I like to leave that one out. But yeah, the answer is yes, I was. So could we talk about how bad the, the injury was without touching on the personal specifics? Like, how, were you in <clears throat> hospital for some time after this then? Yeah, um, um, my femur bone was rebuilt. Um, my tibia was also rebuilt. Um, they, they say that I'll, I'll be on medication for the rest of my life due to um, lead poisoning, I think, is, is I, I often got it, but you have to try and prevent it. Mm. Um, mainly sleeping at night was a difficult one for a very, very long time. I mean, you see my wounds, they're very bad, but but you, they, you can live with them, you know. I train every day, I train seven days a week, so I try and keep my body as right as I possibly can, but in hindsight, it was something that affected me and affected me for a very long time. Did it make you question the sort of life you were leading at that time, or did sort of... Do you know what? When it happened, it was the talk. He said, oh, Flannery's being shot. Oh, do you know, it was the talk. It was, it was everything and more. And I kind of thrived off it. Being the age I was, I kind of, I was immature and I was looking for a, a spotlight as such. And um, I kind of thrived off it, you know. And then um, when, when I got involved in what I was involved in, it was always, it was always like, oh, well, you don't, you know, you didn't want to fuck with him because, do you understand me? So... Yeah, so it's brownie points in the underworld instead of sort of at that age there. You know, I, listen, I'd rather not have it not happen than have the brownie points, trust me, because it mm. doesn't, it, you don't just stitch it up and it goes away on the day. It's something that sticks with you for life. Mm, indeed. So, um, talking about the sort of present future, you mentioned earlier you've got children. And so let's talk about the children. How many children have you got? Quite a few. Yeah? And all with one woman? Or? Absolutely not. No. So you've got children sort of spread around the, the country or so? Countries. Countries? Nice. And so do you enjoy being a father? Most certainly, yes. It's, it's, it's um, number one. Um, all my children are very, very important to me. They're all Flannerys, they're all mine, they're my blood, and everything I do is for them, you know what I mean? So I've only got boys, I've no daughter. Nice. So what got I, lucky. Wh whatever woman gives me a daughter will be a very, very special woman, you know? So you're craving the daughter now? Yeah, I plan on only ever loving three women in my life. My mother, my daughter and the woman that gives her to me. So nice. that's kind of it for me. But so you've got, you got your football team of boys now. And it's, uh, need I've, I've got boys on. My boys are, are there and they're behind me all the way and I'm behind them every step of the way. Mm. And so let's talk about your plans for the future, Flemery. So what are your plans now? Obviously, you're out of jail now last year. Obviously, the little hiccup now, they've managed to hold you for a few weeks. But you're not involved in anything, so that's going to get thrown out. What are your plans for the future? Talk to me about what the next few years look like for you. Uh, the most important thing would be to stay alive. Um, you, you know, people laugh when I say it, but staying of alive, course. staying alive, would be important because what you have to remember is drug dealers aren't gangsters, but they've got money. And I know with the with the damage I've done across England, I would most certainly want me dead. 
you know, I've either robbed your brother or shagged your missus. It's it's plain and simple. I was renowned for a lot of things in life, you know, and and I mean, staying alive would be the most important one. I mean, I've I've got you. You were with us that day in Manchester. You've seen our farm. You've seen the people around me. I don't think that there's there's a unity in England like us. So I just enjoy living life. Once I'm with my boys and I'm with my people, and you got the Barkers and the Joyces and mm. Flannery's always stuck in the middle. You know, it's it's. Life is good. Well, I mean, some call us dangerous, others call us good looking, you know what I mean? So it depends on what way you look at us. I, I just call it the good looking people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, we've, we, there's a horse for every course in that company, you know, and loyalty and respect in that in that corner, as you've seen on that day, there's, there's no better, there's no more, you know what I mean? They've, they're really, really concrete, solid, and they're there for me every single step of the way. I mean, I landed in jail just recently, and if I need anything, it's there, and they're the same to me. You know, nice. So, um, obviously, where you came to sort of be known to a lot of people was in the video where you were talking about the gambling, how on the betting on the fight. Sorry, um, what are you putting down? Is there any bets you're going to be putting down? Have you put my, my, my money initially was the money that kind of set the tone in yeah. that fight? There has, there has been money placed. Um, I'd like to wish the two men the best of luck on the day. Um, may the best man win. I already know who that is, but I would like to wish the two of them the best of luck. Um, but in relation to money, I mean, you could have what you like on it. Mm. You know, I'd love, I'd love to have an awful lot more, but there's not a man to take my money. Just put it that way. Of course, and so it looks like Dougie's really been training hard and taking it seriously, isn't it? Obviously. Yeah, yeah. In and out. He's. I was on the phone to him last night for two hours. We said goodbye to each other ten times, and then we both had something else to say. So I'm on the phone all the time. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, like I say, within the traveller community, the bare knuckle stuff for the names a big, big thing, isn't it? Within the traveller community, and obviously, um, obviously, I was speaking to Dougie before in the in, in talking about he might be able to take people. Would you be allowed to go to the fight? Or? I will be there on the day. With, yeah, with me little Gucci bangle around my foot, I will be there on the day. Um, most well, certainly, I'll, I'll probably travel with Dougie there on the day. Mm, and that's still May the second, is it? The second. Nice and. Um, so talk to me about anyone you sort of rate or you've got, um, who you hold in a high esteem then. Is there anyone, any yeah. of your friends, other than Dougie, obviously we've mentioned Dougie, is there anyone, and Dougie's Johnny in that? Yeah, Dougie's Johnny, obviously all the Barkers are very of close. Course, the I don't really rate anyone, there's one thing about me, I've always done my own fucking thing, I always set my own standard, if I wanted something I went and got it, I've never failed yet. Mm. I don't really rate anyone, I mean, who's, who's the, Barrow bar, watch a football game and see someone score a goal. Okay, what, right. One guy who I will mention, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, no, and, no, I am, and, I, and I am going to mention him because he's under, he he's gets the same scrutiny as me, from the, play, the police, the public, the media, whatever else. And he's a man that's doing good things in the world. And he's a man that's trying to, to, to develop and do things correctly. And he's not getting the opportunity to do so. Is uh, Sam Walker. The infamous Sam Walker. There's, there's a man doing something right in life and not to be allowed to do something right. You know, he's got a GPS tag on like me at the moment for no apparent reason. We're on the highest, highest f form of whatever. You know, you've got terrorists that aren't on what, what me and him are on. Mm. Most certainly, do you know, and, and there's a man doing good things in life. How many children has he fed? How many children has that man fed? Of course. But you'd rather have him stood in a survey queue and feed him. For a driving offence that didn't even exist. Well, whatever it was, as I said, we've all done things that we're not proud of, but when, when you've turned around in life and you're trying to do good things, allow it to happen. Yeah. You know, I, I hear about everyone in life, about man's done this and man's done that and fucking, you, you know, you hear rappers talking about it all the time. You never see anybody giving back. You never see anybody giving it back. Mm. You know, you never see anybody giving a fucking thing back. They talk about watches and fucking this and all, band or it, but a load of shit because I got more money in my mouth than any of them bastards I'll ever have on their neck. You know, they ain't never fed a kid, yeah? It's easy to have a Gucci belt in the club when your mother is walking up seven flights of stairs carrying her shop. Of course. I mean, who the fuck needs a Gucci belt for that? No, you understand? Because next week your mate is going to be wearing it in the fucking photograph beside you. you so know, that, that's not grafting. That's not making money. Where you come today, that's dope. Of course. We, you, we, we, when you met us boys in Manchester, that yeah. was Skrilla. That was, that was the realest of the real. And that was your eyes that seen that, nobody else. You know? So when people are talking, when I see you giving back, a man like me who's been there and done it, that's when I'll rage. Mm. Until then, I ain't even going to talk about you. You know? Of course, there's a lot of pretenders out there, isn't it? So we're in the Instagram age now, aren't we? Where <coughs> it's easy for people to put a couple of pictures up, spend all their money on a cup belts and stuff like you say. And, uh, yeah, Listen, I've always, I've always tried to avoid this seat. 
I've always, I mean, you, you've seen my social media, I've only got one bearing in mind, King Irish, what's on it, four or five posts? You know, and that's just me and my brothers, that's, that's, that's fuck all, mm. you know? Because what you have to remember is when I show something, they arrive the next morning to take it. The only reason they, they haven't took these out of my head is because they can't get the fucking pliers in my mouth. <laughs> Plain and simple, you know? They got 13 phones belong to me this year. My son's iPad. That 49,000 has not been talked about. How many watches have they got belong to me? How many fucking chains? You know? Any car you see me in, it's not in my name. It's not in my name because I don't own the fucking thing. You know? Because I can't. And that's the difference. Yeah, I mean, um, the law has the laws on their side, unfortunately, and it's presumed guilty if you've done something in the past. And obviously, you're living the result of obviously having a sort of infamous name within the underworld. But hopefully, you can. Well, when you're when you're in them when you're in them high grade crimes, when you've been caught with, with with the likes of firearms, or when a firearm comes in your case, like my extortion case, as I said, I've never seen a firearm. You know, but but when it gets thrown into the into the mix, mm. you're known as that high profile prisoner or that high profile criminal, or you know, a man that can walk out there and get a gun on the road is classed as somebody that's w well involved. I most certainly was not that man, but I was brandished to be that man. Mm. And so. Um What's going on with this GPRS thing? Like when is it that on indefinitely then? Like when can you go about your business and go back to London and be able to do go about your You are Sam Walker that <laughs> he'll have the same answer. We don't fucking know. We don't fucking know. When you, you know As I said, if I had a pair of Wellington boots on today and I was picking potatoes, I'd never see a GPS. I'd cool. never see a GPS in my life. But so there's obviously like you say, there's bail or bail restrictions on you going within a certain month. And I'm banned out of London. And these are indefinitely... London's a big place, you know. And this is indefinitely banned out of London. Yeah, I'm banned out of London. I'm banned out of Luton as well. There was one offence that was committed in Luton, which which I wasn't even in Luton at the time. Mm. Um, I was I was in bed with a female um, who, who states the very same thing. But un, until they're happy that I wasn't in Luton at that time, I'll be banned from Luton. Mm. There's not much in Luton anyway, but a couple of good people, that's about it. Indeed. So like I said, you just come out last week, so you're training hard. I train hard anyway. I train, train seven days a week, all year round. I never, I never really miss a day. So I like to keep fit. I like to keep my head in order. I eat clean. I don't really do much life, much in life correctly. So I try and keep that one thing correctly. Mm, indeed. And so, um, is there anything else, sort of topics you'd like to touch on today at all? For now? No, I mean, I just like to ask, ask the authorities. I mean, I've tried to do it correctly so many times. I just like to ask them to leave me be. You know, I mean, I left prison last Wednesday and a drone followed me to, to where I first went to change the vehicle, to grab my clothes and to come to my own property here now. I mean, I'm not worth the drone following me. I'm not worth the surveillance. I mean, I'm just a good looking Irishman trying to get on in life. If you guys want to follow me and see how many, how, how many people I'm involved or what I'm doing, most certainly do it. But it's, it's only wasting your time and wasting your finances. Give mm. it to charity. I'll give it to Sam Walker and let him give it to charity. You know, don't spend money on me. I'm not worth it. Any girlfriend I've ever had, I've told the same thing. Don't spend money on me. I'm not oh. worth it. I tell oh. the police the very same thing. All right. Well, um, any sort of shout outs you want to give to anyone other than the Joyce's and Sam? No, no. Most certainly not. No? I don't. I'm just happy enough to be here. Me, myself and Irish today. Anyone that's good to me, they know who they are. Um, I've mentioned enough of people along the way and that's enough for me. Anyone that... I wrote it from prison. If you've got a letter from me, whether whether we still speak, whether we still talk, just know I hold you in high regard. No matter what's going on between us, anyone that got in touch with me when I was on in prison, whether it's the first sentence or second, know that you're, you'll always be important to me. Right. So, well, I much appreciate the opportunity to come see you when you're so much in demand at the moment, and um, hopefully down the line we could do some more bits as well. Yeah, please God, we'll, we'll touch again. I just like to free Scott Moore and Luke Moore. HMP Birmingham, another two men should not be behind the door. I'm a very good friend, my brother Lewis Gilder, who's an Oakwood right now. I need to get him out from behind the blue door as well. I need him out here, so. And everyone else I've met along the way, you know. Just do your time, keep your head down, and when you come out, try and live like Flannery. I know it's not easy, but do your best. Of course. Well, people, this has been Flannery, aka The Extortionist. Thank you very much, Flannery, and I uh, hope we'll see you soon. And like and subscribe, people. Thank you very much. Thank you.